1992, a commercial aircraft carrying 31 people left Ho Chi Minh City for the beach resort in Nha Trang. Two passengers were headed for a romantic getaway, unaware of the fateful moment that would shatter their dreams forever. The plane crashed into a mountain top enclosed by the Vietnamese jungle, leaving Annette Hurricanes trapped in the wilderness as the sole survivor. When she awoke, battered and suffering from numerous wounds, she faced her dead mate and was hardly able to move. What followed was an incredible story of survival, mystery, and higher spirit. Our guest today, Annette Herfkins, is a beaming example of what it means to rise up over adversity. Her determination and will to live were challenged years ago during a plane crash where she was the sole survivor. Since then, for the last 22 years, she's been back to Vietnam twice, this time to visit the mountain of the crash site again. And we've also had a chance to get her to come to the studio to talk to us. And she's right here with us right now. Hello, Annette. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. So let's go back 22 years ago. Um, tell me a little bit about how the incident happened and where were you on the plane? I was visiting my fiancé who was setting up two branches here um, in Ho Chi Minh City and Hanoi for ING Bank. Mm -hmm. We were going on a short romantic vacation because we had very little time. We were both working very hard as bankers. Uh, I arrived in Ho Chi Minh City. I had, it was my first time really. We, he booked an early flight. We were picked up very early in the morning. We drove to the airport. I was not happy about the early flight. Mm -hmm. I was even less happy to see such a small plane. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very claustrophobic. I said, I don't want to go in there. Mm -hmm. He said, please do it for us, go. It's only, it's only 20 minutes. And I, so I forced myself to sit down. It was only 30 people around me and I was really just focusing on, on, on staying the put. End. Yeah, on staying put. And um, so we took off, and after 20 minutes of citing poems and everything that I could think of, not to get scared and mm -hmm. more claustrophobic, we did not go down. And he said, No, in fact, I, I cheated you and into believing the flight was 55 minutes, mm -hmm. uh, five, 20, 20 minutes, minutes instead of 55. Mm -hmm. So in the 50th minute, there was a tremendous drop mm -hmm. and accelerating motors. Mm -hmm. People were screaming. Mm -hmm. Another drop, more screaming. Mm -hmm. um, he said, now I don't like this. I said, well, of course, after the first drop, sorry. I said, I said of course, a small plane will drop like that. And um, don't worry, hold my hand. Mm -hmm. And he grabbed for my hand, I grabbed for his. Mm -hmm. And then all went black. Mm -hmm. So what happened when you woke up? So one moment I was flying with roaring motors. Next I wake up to the, for me, eerie sounds of the jungle, mm -hmm. crickets and, and noises I couldn't recognize. Mm -hmm. um, the fuselage has broken into two pieces and I could see the vegetation out of the front of the airplane mm -hmm. and my left I saw Willem, Pasha as I called him, and he was dead, still strapped in his seat. Mm -hmm. He was dead. I could see that immediately. And then I focused on myself. I had a, a chair on top of me mm -hmm. with a dead man in it, as it turned out, and I pushed it away. Mm -hmm. And then I don't remember anything until my next memory. Okay. And I'm out there, out on the jungle floor. I must have gone into shock. Wow. And do you, do you remember your physical condition back then? No, I was mentally, I must, I mean, first I saw my fiancé, my future, dead next to me. Mm -hmm. That was all-consuming. Mm -hmm. Next, I wake up on the jungle floor. The plane is behind me, or I wake up. I mean, I get, I'm, my next memory is, right. is that. So I must have gotten out of the plane, mm -hmm. but I was really badly hurt and I had 
multiple fractures in my hips mm -hmm. and I had a collapsed lung and I had mm -hmm. a broken jaw mm -hmm. and I had awful wounds on my legs and, and somehow I must have summoned the strength to get out of that airplane and, and, and drop my body because it was on the slope. Um, wow. So I must have dropped it for a meter or so. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember how I did that. It must have been excruciating pain. That's another reason probably why my mind has blocked it out. Um, so my next memory is next to a man, a Vietnamese man, sitting about uh, this much away from me, mm -hmm. uh, talking in English. So he was also out of the plane, just like you Out were. of the plane, yes, on the mountain slope. Mm -hmm. And around me there were a few more mountain, there were more, few more people out and about on the mountain slope. About There was a girl and there was, I think, two more bodies out, not moving, but there was still some moaning. I see, I see. So how far did you end up from the plane at that moment in time? I would get around 10 meter up the hill behind me. So, but at the moment I decided not to look behind me anymore. Mm -hmm. Because there, I knew that my fiance was there. I see. So I just, I have not turned my head anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I just focus on what was right in front of me, in my peripheral view. But I have not turned my head for eight days. I see. In the middle of the jungle. Everything hurts. I can't move. My right foot is covered in blood. But the worst sight is in my shin. I can see the bone. Four inches of bluish bone stick out through layers of flesh. Then I see Pasha across the aisle. He is lying in his seat, which has somehow flipped backward. He has a smile on his lips, a sweet little smile. He is dead. In an interview in, to CNN, you actually said that you were clear-headed enough to make a plan. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about that plan? Well, first, I talk, let me still talk about first about the man. So I, I just had a very rational conversation with him at first. Um, I said, I, do you think they're going to look for us? And mm -hmm. he said, yes, because in English. Right. And it was a Vietnamese man, uh, because I'm a very important man. And I said, okay. And, and then he went quiet again. And again, I, the first day, I, I think I was really bugging him mm -hmm. every hour. So are you sure they're going to look for us? I don't see any planes. And, mm -hmm. and let's go and find some water. And then he said I already had something to drink. And then I noticed that I didn't have any more my wraparound jean skirt that mm -hmm. I was wearing. I was sitting in my underwear. So mm -hmm. I was embarrassed. Mm -hmm. And he was <laughs> such a gentleman that he opened his suitcase and handed me his pants from a suit and I had to put that on and that was really really painful because like, I had mm -hmm. 12 fractures in my hip mm -hmm. and the lung and it was but I did that because of course mm -hmm. appearances call them up appearances <laughs> I'm sitting next to a gentleman in the in the in the jungle so I did do that and and then he, he retreated more and more into himself and in his wounds and he would not answer me anymore. And by the end of the first day, he died. He had died. I see. And then, then I'd realized how alone I was. And I'd never been so entirely alone. And then it's the sunset, and it got dark. And I really just accepted my situation. I, I was mm -hmm. not in making a plan yet. I said, OK, it's night. Now you have to go to sleep. I see. Did anything memorable happen on the second day for you? On that mountain. But well, the second day is when I start making, the, well, the, I don't, I mean, sorry, now I, stand, I start making a plan at some point. Mm -hmm. um, you have to read the book exactly when and where. So mm -hmm. I just also, and how. But I'd really realized at some point how important it was to be there alive and that I had to get some water and that I had more water than food. Mm -hmm. um, so I had to make a plan to get water, to mm -hmm. get rainwater. And then I start moving also, the, the, the smell became unbearable. Right. And the man next to me was eaten alive by the insects and I just had to move away from him. I and see. that's when I decided to make a plan mm -hmm. and see. get myself rainwater. So on the eighth day you were rescued. What were you doing? What happened before the eighth day? I think by, so I, by day 
five, six, I got really more. What I did also in, in the earlier day, I focused on the beauty of the jungle instead of the, the, the dead. And the more I focus on that beauty, the more beautiful it became. And, mm -hmm. and obviously this has been um, helped by the fact that I was hungry and I didn't eat. But the more I got more and more into that beauty and it became a part of that beauty. Mm -hmm. And the more details, right? It was really, I go looking more and more in depth at a drop of water on, on a, a leaf, mm -hmm. on the flower. I was really focusing, focusing more and more and more on, on the little details. And even on the insects walking over me. At one point, there was a centipede, and, and I just mm -hmm. fell more and more as a part of the jungle. And I felt I was getting energy from the jungle, mm -hmm. and it kept me going. Was that something that you did consciously, or did it something just that just came naturally as you started to let go and started to look at the jungle around you? No, I, I say first it was mind over matter, and then it was heart over mind. I see. It really, so I think by controlling my emotions and by controlling my mind, not by letting it run off in what if scenarios, I was, a, I was capable to listen to my instincts and to my heart. Yeah. And then I really believe that. So let's, let's go back a little bit on, on the several days before the eighth day. How did you keep track of time? Did you look at the sun? Did you look at night? Were, were you aware of how many days had passed? Well, at first, the gentleman next to me had a watch. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at that watch every hour. Oh, and, wow. and that's why I said another hour passed, and they are still not looking for us. And day two, I did the same. But then when I realized I had to move away from him also to get the water, I just started to count night after night, day after day. I was counting mm -hmm. the days. I had little else to do. Uh -huh. so. <laughs> and was your count accurate? Was your count accurate? I believe it was. The last two days might have been a bit blurred because I, I saw men definitely the day before I was rescued. Mm -hmm. And I saw men standing looking at me dressed in orange. Mm -hmm. And I was not 100% sure if I was, believe I couldn't believe my own eyes, mm -hmm. literally. And he got me back into reality more than anything. And then I start mm. feeling my pain again. Uh -huh. And I yelled at him in all languages that I could think of. <laughs> but he was just standing there. And, and looking at you. And, and looking back at, at me you. and staring at me. And I was not doing anything. Right. So then a rational person I am, I said, well, I must invent him. So I'm, I'm inventing people now. But at the same time, I do, did realize that I was back into reality because everything hurt so much. And I, I, I had to give up a little bit on this beautiful state of mind that I was before. Mm -hmm. So that was an open question for me. Mm -hmm. And suddenly it rains. And how? It is that kind of hard rain that punches you. It strikes my wounds and it hurts my face when I turn it up with my mouth open. I almost gag. Happily, so much water I get to swallow. I move on my elbows. That hurts really badly. And my legs are broken. I have to pull my body along with my arms. I feel a stab in my chest, but I put all my life and my effort to get to the wing. Finally, I can reach right into the insulation material. The insulation could work like a sponge to suck up the rain. So what, what helped you, in your opinion, survive? What helped you to survive all the way until the eighth day, the day that you were rescued? Listening to my instincts, surrendering to the situation, staying open mm -hmm. for the suggestions of, my, of staying open and, and focusing on the beauty mm -hmm. instead of on the dead. Exactly, exactly. It was a choice. Exactly. So let's, let's recall how you felt when the rescue team came for you on the eighth day. Were you surprised to see them and were you ec ecstatic to see them? Yeah, it was very matter-of-factly first like, oh. But then when they handed me that bottle, at well, first they showed me a passenger list and I had to show out my own name. I mm -hmm. had to, so I said, Annette Harriet and said, okay. And then they handed me a bottle of mineral water, water and <laughs> that was ecstatic. That was, I cannot, I have no words to describe that first sip of water. Right. That was the best thing you've had the in a long time. The best thing ever, ever, mm -hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. ever. <laughs> That's great. So it, 
I know. I've read your book, and I, I know that it is. It wasn't an easy ride getting out of the jungle at all. And sometimes you described yourself as like a roasting pig, right? Yes. Let's, let's let's talk a little bit about your ride out of the jungle. How did that feel? Well, first, um, it was extraordinary at first when they 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 literally put me on a stick, mm -hmm. like a pig, like mm -hmm. on in a hammock on a stick, and they carried me between two the two men, and but first the first moment it was the first time I truly felt panic when I had mm -hmm. to leave uh -huh. because you like I don't want to leave I want to stay also with Pasha I said no 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 I have to stay here mm -hmm. so my first my very first reaction was like I, I don't want to leave here and it will that was the first time I truly panicked mm -hmm. and then they would start walking and then I breathe through it and then I we were going up and down, and, and then I got my sense of humor back, and I thought, well, <laughs> this is quite an experience to be carried like a pig in the jungle. So it was, it was my sense of humor kept me, kept me with it again. And then, but then we we camped, and I was begging more and more for cold water, and they only gave me rice, warm rice water, which is the right thing to do, as I found out later, because mm -hmm. it would not be good for my body at all to, mm -hmm. to have the cold water after after such a long time. Mm -hmm. So they gave me warm rice water and they made a fire mm -hmm. and they camped. Um, but that was for me awkward because everyone was talking very loud in, 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 in Vietnamese and, and I was hanging on that stick. Mm -hmm. And then they went into the tents to sleep. And now all of a sudden I'm like half civilized and I had to sleep on the stick <laughs> and outside <laughs> in the rain. And that's when I really, that part, I, I, oh no, I didn't like that very much. I see, I see. Yes. But then they were very nice men. They were very warm to me. They understood. Mm -hmm. And uh, they understood and they would, um, they would give me rice water or they would just show their presence to me. Even though you guys didn't speak the same language. No, but we could totally connect. And I wanted to smoke. They were smoking, and I wanted to smoke, so I did like that. I said, no, no, no. <laughs> and then I ha they had to laugh. That I knew that it was not good for me. Right. And they said no. And I, it, we, had, we had exchanges. We had multiple very mm -hmm. warm exchanges. Mm -hmm. 22 years ago, Annette Hafkins was a young, beautiful, and accomplished Dutch woman. At 31 years of age, Annette seemed to have everything that epitomized the perfect life. A prestigious job at one of the world's leading banks, a very high income, a passion for trading international bonds, frequent jet setting across the world, and a first love spanning 13 years. Annette was the subject of much envy and admiration. But then disaster struck and everything was turned upside down. Annette had to struggle for her life. On November the 14th, 1992, Annette Hafkins and her fiancé, Willem van der Paas, also known as Pache, were among 31 passengers who travelled from Ho Chi Minh City to Nha Trang on board the Vietnam Airlines flight VN-474. About 30 kilometres from Nha Trang, 16 kilometres from the nearest village, the aircraft crashed into a mountain top. 30 passengers died. Annette was the sole survivor. How long did it take you to get back to normal life once you got back to the Netherlands? Um, about, we flew back, um, the, the, the accident was November 14, three weeks later we flew from Singapore to Amsterdam. It took an, about three weeks to put myself together, I think, I mm -hmm. mean I had all those fractures, right. I had skin rafts. I had um, the jaw, where there was screws in my jaw, mm -hmm. that had to be removed and I had to walk with that for another half a year or so. And mm -hmm. I, I had to continuously have plastic surgery for those wounds. But mm -hmm. I did fly back to Madrid. Mm -hmm. um, my first steps were on January 1st, which is six weeks later. And wow, I that's a back, month and a yes, half later. Month and a half. Yeah, oh, everything cool. grew back together. I drank lots of milk. <laughs> and, then, and then we f flew back together with Jamie. He picked me up to fly back to Madrid mm -hmm. mid-January. Mid so look, two months later. I went. And you were starting work two months right yes. after the accident yes. happened. Wow. Yeah, that was my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you did say that you, you, weren't a, you weren't willing to give up you know, your, your career, your life. That, no, that, you that still was had. what I had left. Right. Yeah. right. So... Is it right to say that the accident has changed your life in a way that you could never 
imagined it. Of it course, I mean, one minute you have a fiancé in the future, and it was for me all about him, losing him, losing right. my, my mate, my future, mm -hmm. yes. That's always for my life will be before and after the accident. I see. So how, how, how do you view the meaning of life, or, or how do you just view life in general after the accident? After the accident, I just took it the same as it was before, like mm -hmm. shit happens. Right. And it happened to me and, and I had to, and I didn't feel so different than other widows. For mm -hmm. me, it doesn't matter how he mm -hmm. died, the fact that he died exactly. was most important. I so I didn't focus so much on, on all the drama of what I really, I, I, I just missed him. Mm -hmm. And I felt like so many other widows in the world at the same time. And I, I didn't feel special for that. I, see. I felt actually connected to those other widows, if anything. Mm -hmm. So my, my, for me, it was being widowed. Everything else was... At the same time, I did have that beautiful experience, but that was for me death. I see. Death was beautiful at that point. Mm -hmm. Living was more difficult. Mm -hmm. And go back to the life. And, and, and so people ask me whether I felt guilty for surviving. I said, well, I mm -hmm. truly... I thought the surviving part was the hard part. Mm -hmm. On August 12, 2014, the Vietnamese translated version of Annette's book, Turbulence, A True Story of Survival, was launched in Ho Chi Minh City. At the book launch, Annette had a chance to meet four very special women. We'll take a look at who they are and how that meeting went. When Annette Hafkins was rescued and brought to Ho Chi Minh City for treatment, she was not yet aware that upon the crash of the Yak-40, the rescue helicopter MI-8 was ordered to travel from Nha Chang Airport to the mountains. It also crashed on Oha Mountain, only five kilometers from the Yak-40 crash site. All seven crew members died. 22 years later, at the launch of her book in Ho Chi Minh City, Annette met Nguyen Thị Lan for the first time. Lan's husband, Nguyen Quang Bing, was the pilot in command on the rescue helicopter MI-8. He died trying to approach and rescue Annette. At the book launch, First News also gave Annette the chance to meet three other widows of that fateful flight. They are Ho Thu Thuy, the wife of pilot Liu Kung Luong, Phan Thanh Ngoc Khánh, the wife of co-pilot yeah, Chu Ming Dong, and Ho Thay Thanh Vân, the wife of mechanic Zung Kum Su. The husbands were all crew members on the Yak-40 flight, which carried Annette. <laughs> For Annette, the launch of her autobiography in Vietnam has turned out to be a special reunion. It was very special because for many years I was the only one. I had, I had, 
I was the only one in Holland in, in, in my life and it's really nice to connect with them. It's beautiful. One day after the book launch, motivated by the reunion and the widow's wishes, First News invited all of them back to the Oja Valley to remember the victims of the two plane crashes. Annette, so tell us a little bit about your meeting with those four women and how did you feel? I felt a bit confronted and um, overwhelmed, mm. but I, at the same time, I did see the I did see the, the meaning in it, and and um, I I'm really happy that we did it, mm. and really happy that we we were had to, had the opportunity to connect together. So um, I have to ask you a question. So how did you actually hear about the fate of MI8, the plane that came to rescue you? Only when in 2006, when I came back to Vietnam, mm -hmm. there was a lot of in misinformation. My rescuer thought that I had died. My rescuer thought I had not made it at all. Mm -hmm. That they, they didn't know that they had rescued my life. Mm -hmm. I did not know. There was never knew there was a helicopter. And there was a bench, people mentioned it. They said mm -hmm. there was a helicopter, copter looking for you. Um, I never. I said, well, I never saw a helicopter. I, I don't believe so. Mm -hmm. So it was for me, totally new news mm -hmm. when I came back in 2006 and I had I not made that trip mm -hmm. had I not overcome those fears actually right. to to come I would have never known I see so um, let's talk a little bit about your book uh, it was published in 2014 in America in the US so what took you so long to, to write it well it was more um, something that people always were expecting from me and suggesting to me you have to write a book you have to write a mm -hmm. book I took it more as a duty as a civil duty because I did really feel that I had a, had something to sh important to share and I sat down um, for a year every morning at five o'clock I woke up wow. and I wrote two three hours before the children woke up mm -hmm. and then in the afternoon I would edit those pages and then I had written a year later I had written about 500 pages and mm -hmm. short stories mm -hmm. and um, then I thought oh somebody will get it what it's all about but they don't still when I still had to so I took another year maybe perhaps and then I started re-editing reorganizing all those pieces and shift them and well writing is rewriting but I still wanted it very much to go about my son as much as about the accident exactly. and I know that the public and the publishers and the newspapers are more interested in the first part mm -hmm. but I insisted to write about mm -hmm. my son and compare an accident which is like a stone in the water mm -hmm. and my son who is a chronic situation exactly. but he's also my teacher mm -hmm. he's there for because it's not because it's chronic and that's what mm -hmm. I'm trying to say also as opposites, that the advantage and the disadvantages, and the disadvantage and the advantage is that the fact that he's chronic is, of course, worse. But also, that's why he's a continuing teacher for me, mm -hmm. and he's an angel. And and again, the, that's what I wanted to to communicate: that the same attitude that I had in the jungle to focus on the beauty instead of the, the dead, on focusing on what is there in my son and not what I should have been, and not comparing mm -hmm. to typical kids. Right. I realize what is there and it's he's a gift mm -hmm. and it is just a matter of looking it's the same as how you look at things right and he's there and it's a gift and I really wanted to communicate that part to other parents please accept your child mm -hmm. and see what's there and not what you want to be there mm -hmm. so that's one of the messages that you want to send out to the parents what about people who who have not had kids yet what about the general audience are there any other messages that you would like to convey through your book yeah every situation every situation there's always the good and the bad because that's life that's the duality of life and you always have an option mm -hmm. where to focus you always there's an option and there's always an option to define it mm -hmm. and redefine it as something that you teaches you that gives you depth that con connects you to other people there mm -hmm. is always it's just a matter of defining it. At a book signing event at Chivit Bookstore in Ho Chi Minh City, when an audience member asked Annette how to control one's emotions, she answered immediately. I think the world is too much like uh, cameras. I think that's not right. I think the opposite. I think you cry when you have to cry, but not on the cameras. You 
friend it was exactly this mental strength that helped Annette through the eight days of near-death experience in the jungle of Oha Mountain. She waited eight days for rescue to come after her flight had crashed and killed all the other 30 passengers on board. Cái điều truyền tải của cuốn sách mà tôi cảm thấy rất là tâm đắc nhất đó chính là cái sự nghị lực sống của cô khi mà gặp một cái tai nạn rất là kinh khủng khi phải mất người thân khi phải trải qua những cái vết thương về thể chất và còn những vết thương về tâm hồn của mình nữa cô vẫn cương nghĩ rằng là mình không được khóc mình phải làm quen với những cái khó khăn đó làm quen với cả những con giòi bỏ những cái vết thương trên cơ thể của mình để mà có thể vượt qua khi mà máy bay rơi thì nỗi sợ hãi của con người đó là sự thật nhưng cô đã từ đó cô đã kìm nén sự sợ hãi để thành một nghị lực sống để vươn lên để chống chọi với cái chết và không phải là chuyện cá nhân của cô nữa khi qua quyển sách này mà nó đã truyền cho chúng ta những bạn đọc đó là về nghị lực sống phi thường và những ý nghĩ tiêu tích cực sẽ làm cho con ngân chúng ta đứng vững trước những nghịch cảnh của cuộc đời. Annette released her book Turbulence, a true story of survival in her country of residence, the United States, in February 2014. Right after the release, First News Chivia Company acquired the rights to translate the book into Vietnamese, thus adding a new entry to its seats for the sole book list. Bản thân tôi cũng học được cô rất nhiều điều, không nói chứ ít, nếu hay là không ước gì nó không xảy ra và chấp nhận nó như một thực tại và tìm cách lạc quan nhất để để sống sót, để tồn tại và vượt lên và nên cô trở về và thái độ rất là tự tin, rất là vui và cô chia sẻ với nhiều người khác. Cô không bao giờ coi cô là là nạn nhân cả. Đó là một cách rất hay của sự cho đi hơn là mong muốn được nhận. And its 300-page long autobiography was translated by An Bien within one month, during which the world was shocked by a series of tragic plane crashes. Như tác giả cũng đã chia sẻ trong những lần sang Việt Nam, trong những lần này sang Việt Nam thì hãy biết sống cho trọn với hiện tại thì tôi nghĩ đó là cái thông điệp mà tôi đồng cảm với tác giả nhất thì bởi vì cuộc đời thì ai cũng nghĩ là dài lắm nhưng mà chỉ vì một tai nạn thôi thì nó trở nên chống dính vô cùng. After Vietnam, Annette plans to release the book in her native country, the Netherlands, followed by China and a number of other Asian countries before launching a Spanish language edition in South America. With her life story, she wants to convey a message of love, of gains and losses. I want to tell people not to fear, because if all fear is rooted in death, you might as well not fear. Because my worst fears came true, and it turned out beautiful. The other worst fear, I always was afraid to have an artistic child. I somehow really was afraid of that, and I have an artistic child, and he turned out to be my Buddha, my teacher. He's my teacher, and he's a, he's a gift. So both my fears came true, and both turned out to be a gift. Now you, you've also released your book in Vietnam, in Vietnamese, yes. um, in August this year. Mm -hmm. And did you have you received any of the Vietnamese feedback yet? Yeah, I think I believe I believe they, that it's well. I think the Vietnamese um, recognize the the perseverance part, the against mm -hmm. all odds, the making it under circumstances and difficult circumstances, because obviously mm -hmm. they are the example themselves of 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 such strength and under adverse circumstances mm -hmm. and the resourcefulness of Vietnamese people, the, the strength of Vietnamese people. It's very evident when mm -hmm. you're here. Mm -hmm. So why did you choose Vietnam as the second country to publish your book after the US? Well, very much because of all those widows and, mm -hmm. and lives that were touched by this crash and yeah. the fact that, that people didn't know that I was rescued, that they rescued me. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that's, right. Some that's of them thought some of them thought you were you were dead, right? Yes, you most of dead. them. They they mm -hmm. all thought basically that I was dead. I see. And I, that's why I insisted on bringing my daughter mm -hmm. as the gift of life that they gave okay. us by rescuing me. Mm -hmm. So recently, the world has witnessed you know some horrible plane accidents yes. this year. What do you hope to say to the family members of the victims on board? I feel for them because they don't know where the bodies are, right. or at least in, in they have found some bodies now, of course, from the Ukraine and, and transporting. But that part was really difficult to deal with mm -hmm. for um, for families because you really need 
that closure, that is really true. Mm -hmm. You need that body of your loved one and know it's there. And so I just feel for them very, very much in, mm -hmm. in, in that. And I feel for them. So during her trip back to Vietnam this time, Annette has brought her daughter back to Oka Mountain, the site of the crash in 1992. Let's take a look at their journey down that fateful memory lane. This is the second time in 22 years that Annette has been reunited with her rescuer, Galvin Hack. Hack was the person who discovered Annette near the crash site on the Oha Mountain in Khenghua Province. I'm so happy to see you. Thank you. Thank you. I hardly ever cry, but I really feel like crying now. <laughs> This is my daughter. Thank you for my daughter. Thank you for saving my life. Long time. Yeah, right. She should speak now. Huh? Do we look alike, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Now 55 years of age, Galvin Hank was the head of the Sun Chung Commune's public security force. He still clearly remembers the moment when he found Annette in the jungle. Bố anh em ùa chạy lên. À, chạy lên bắt đầu là có một cây ngã mà bởi vì là cái 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 quạt máy bay á nó chặt cây ngã luôn à, ngã. bắt đầu là chú bước lên bước lên rồi bắt đầu bước lên trên 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 cây ngã bắt đầu thấy bả la mình mới giật mình té xuống à, té xuống bắt đầu mình bò lên tiếp à, bò lên mới mới tới là là bả mới mới mới, mới xin nước xin nước thì bắt đầu xin nước bắt đầu là mới ảo kêu bác sĩ y sĩ mới cho mới cho thuốc uống thuốc thuốc từ sức vậy đó một mũi tim nữa thuốc từ sức bắt đầu là bắt đầu là để bà khôi phục bắt đầu là mới tao là mới khen vậy vừa là bắt đầu vừa là mới thế là vừa là mới thế bà chỉ mới xin nước 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 lắc đầu chứ không nước 2006 was the first time that Annette returned to Vietnam following the crash. Hank was Annette's guide when she traveled back to the Oha mountain top. This time, Annette brought along her 17-year-old daughter, Yoshi Lupa. Yoshi knows every detail of the story as she helped with language editing on Annette's autobiography. Vietnam is very special to me because without uh, the orange man who saved my mom's life, I wouldn't be alive. So I always think of Vietnam as sort of a, a parent, another parent for me. During this trip back to Oha, Annette also got to meet Nguyễn Thị Kim Kỳ and Mai Thị Minh Châu, two nurses who performed emergency treatment on her at the Khánh Sơn District Health Center, prior to her being transported to Singapore for further care. And here on my leg here. And I lost two children. Hồi đó là chân cái chân này nè, sưng lên nè, rồi là bắt 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 cắn đây nè, rồi là cắn đây hết. And I lost two toes. You see two toes. Đó, cắn bắt cắn đây đây luôn này, sưng hết, sưng hết cả cái chân lên luôn. Con gái á, thế không có mẹ thì chỗ này đâu có con á. returned to Vietnam in 2006 to remember those who died. This time, she has come back to honor the living and life. Vietnam is the country where I lost so much, but then again I gained so much too. I gained so much and I feel now connected to the Vietnamese people. I had a beautiful experience on the mountain, a beautiful experience a near-death experience and dying was beautiful and that took that with me and then later I connected to my rescuers and I'm so happy those two messages I want to my daughter to connect this way and to connect this way that's my message Annette's daughter is also with us here in the studio hi Yoshi how are you today Hi, I'm good. good. So tell, tell us a little bit about, about your trip to Oha Mountain with your mother. Well, it was very, it was emotional and it was very surreal because this story, 
I know very well. Even before I helped edit the book, it was a story that I always told to my friends because it was very cool. It all became very, very real for me to see the mountain and say like, wow, I said, wow, mom, you were there for eight days and like looking at the same mountain and it all became very real for me and the book really came to life. Mm -hmm. We met the orange man, mm -hmm. the one who um, first saw my mom and that was, that was incredible. I've heard so much about him and the orange and man. And his mystery as well. Yeah, <laughs> he's kind of the, the climax of the story when I was telling it and then there was the orange man. So, um, <laughs> And my mom has already told me how special he was, and I was kind of like, okay, yeah, he found you first. Like, I get it, I get it. But really meeting him and kind of holding hands with him and looking into his eyes, and we couldn't communicate because we don't speak the same language, but it was just, it, it was incredible. And I just, it was, he's such an amazing person. You can just see that just by one look in his eyes and the tears in his eyes as he met my mom again and saw me and realized that he had saved not only one life, but three because my brother and I he saved mm -hmm. us as well and mm -hmm. it was incredible uh, it was great indeed it was just fantastic to see how how they connected my daughter and this man and and in how the connection is indeed between two peoples by looking at each other's eyes without culture differences without the looks without everything but it's, it's not necessary it's just the beauty to see those two connect and we also when we happen to have uh, a, a, a snack at, mm -hmm. at a restaurant where the restaurant owner was one of my rescuers and mm -hmm. who it, it was great to see him and I met again the two nurses uh, who last time who straight went for my wounds again mm -hmm. who knew and where and they were it was so dear to see them because I I remember them so well and and it was the, the village right now is much more developed and there's electricity and there was no electricity the first time mm -hmm. And I just, I, that's when I was so impressed also by the Vietnamese people. I, I just, in those women, I see the strength in those women mm -hmm. and the sense of humor mm -hmm. and their warmth. And mm -hmm. the same with my rescuers. So in 2006, 14 years after the accident, you returned to Oka for the first time and you were very fearful at that moment in time. So why did you decide to return to Oka? In because I think I should. Mm -hmm. I always think I shoot. I shoot. I, I again. Also, there were various reasons. Also, to to really connect to these people who saved me. To really look them in the eye and thank you. To, um, but there's also this spiritual spiritual experience I had um, that I really wanted to somehow see with my own eyes. Right. And I just wanted to put that into perspective and and. Um, yeah, revisit that and, and give it a place before I was going out to the world and come and tell them this. Mm -hmm. I really needed to be sure. Right. Yeah, I'm a banker, I'm dark, I'm rational. <laughs> I just, it was a big thing for me to write that down. Exactly. To, um, and I, I just needed everything with my own eyes. And mm -hmm. I also wanted to visit that place with my learned eyes after having children, after having the autistic son and mm -hmm. what I learned about love and loss, to see it the same place with the same, with different eyes. Right. There were many, many points coming together in that return. I see, I see. How different was the, the second trip this time, you know, and why, why was there a difference this time compared to the first in 2006? Well, then it, it was, uh, the last trip I found very much it was about, our, about the people in that generation and this time I feel very much it is the next generation oh. and I, I love that I love mm -hmm. that she's connected on Facebook right. with the daughter of the pilot who mm -hmm. died rescuing me right. and also with the daughter of Mr. Tan mm -hmm. my favorite person of Vietnam Airlines mm -hmm. um, Mr. Tan went with me up the mountain in 2006 right. and he's a beautiful man mm -hmm. and by now we know that he has a beautiful daughter too and mm -hmm. we are connecting on Facebook she's in the in the state mm -hmm. and I, I really that whole opening to the next generation I find mm -hmm. and I really wanted to her to see with her own eyes um, but she had heard about for so many years and, and indeed to connect to these people and mm -hmm. see indeed to overcome fear and overcome cultural differences and overcome external differences mm -hmm. and, and, and really she got that by looking in the eye of the man who rescued me. But it's nothing to do with me. It has to see with his eyes, that person. Right. Right. And, and then there, there was this instant connection between them, right. which, is which is exactly great. why I brought her. Mm -hmm. to, that was the most, the lesson is right. the connection is 
yeah. that an exchange of eyes. Exactly. And you don't need the looks, the beauty, the, of the, the external appearance of people is, is totally irrelevant. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you so much, Annette, for your, for your inspiring story and also for your message this time in Vietnam. Thank you, Annette. Thank you for having yeah. me. And thank you so much, Yoshi. Thank you. All right. So to end today's show, I actually like, would like to hinge on the idea of luck and the lack of luck and their interplay, just as Annette has said just now. And I'd like to read you a quote from her book. It says, she says, I can't help noticing how the more fortunate take ownership of their blessings. When they define, discuss, and judge the less fortunate, they seem to find a reason to hold the less fortunate responsible for their fate. If the fortunate would see the limitations of their luck, perhaps they would not judge or pity. They would be more compassionate. True compassion strips away superior, inferior feelings. Just flip sides and everyone is up. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you next time. Goodbye.